All right, good, good morning, everybody. Thank, thank you, Jason. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start off our discussion of hydroclimate over the last 2,000 years or so by in, injecting a note of paranoia into our comparisons between proxies and potential forcings. So in addition to the, the co-authors that I have listed, I also wanna acknowledge that the work I'm gonna be sharing with you today also includes work done by Samantha Stevenson and Ben Cook, who just recently joined this project. So here's, here's the bottom line. We're talking about mega droughts in our analysis. And the main message that I wanna get across today is that as far as we can tell using our analysis, mega droughts are rare, but the fact that they happen isn't really that unusual. What's really unusual is when you get clusters of mega droughts, several within a few hundred years. And to get clusters of mega droughts, then you need the climate system to do be doing something different than it's been doing at least within the last few decades. So that's the, that's the main message that we have to get across today. And I'll now try and show you some evidence to back up, back up that claim. So mega droughts, when I use the word mega drought, what I mean is, is long duration events that are about as severe or more severe than the droughts we've seen over the last few decades, but more longer lasting. So really this is the definition that was, was shared by Richard Seeger and is used quite a lot in the literature when you're looking at mega droughts in North America. Now in Western North America, I think the gold standard for understanding past mega droughts across this region is really the North American Drought Atlas that has been led by Ed and Dave Miko and Dave Staley and several other collaborators over the last decade and a half. And when you look at the North American Drought Atlas over the last 2,000 years or so, you see certain events that really stand out. In particular, I want to draw your attention to the 11th century, when even if you average drought conditions over several decades, you still see a large portion, over 40% of the area, over 40% of the Western United States, in mega drought for a long time during the 11th century. And so, so now that we have this wonderful history based on tree ring records spanning the last several centuries in this part of the world, now we can ask the question, if we know that mega droughts have happened in the past from tree rings and other proxies, then why did they happen? And I, I think it's safe to say that there are two competing or, or, or different explanations for why we would expect these long duration mega droughts to happen. And the two explanations really connect to some foundational papers in climatology. The first really comes out of the work by, done by Jacob Bjorkness in the 50s and 60s that argues that the oceans are the main source or seat of low frequency variability within the climate system. So that if you want to produce a prolonged mega drought in a place like the Western United States, you need to push the climate system into a different, different state using some kind of exotic forcing, something different, either higher solar irradiance or dust feedback, just something that we haven't seen within the last century or so when there have not been any mega droughts in this area. Now the second possible explanation comes out of the work done by Klaus Hasselmann looking at stochastic behavior within the climate system. And this is the idea that low frequency variability basically piles up in the climate system if you let things, if you let uh, high uh, interannual variability proceed for, for a long time. So maybe mega droughts will just happen inevitably. If you watch the system for a long enough time, they're gonna occur purely as a consequence of internal variability. You don't need to turn up the sun, you don't need drought or dust feedbacks to kick in, you just need to watch the system for a thousand years and you're probably gonna see a mega drought. So here's the question that we're trying to address. Can you get a mega drought just based on interannual variability plus the way the climate system is organized or organizes itself? either global SSTs or Western United States hydroclimate, if you just let it go for enough time. If you let the system proceed, will you eventually see mega droughts? Now, one of the ways that we could, of course, deal with this question is use simulations from, from general circulation models, but they're expensive, and it's also difficult to run them for long periods of time. And if we think that, that mega droughts happen maybe once or twice a millennium, even if you run a GCM for a thousand years, maybe you'll see one of them, maybe you'll see two, and it becomes very difficult still to tease out the mechanism behind it. So my collaborator, my colleague, my good friend Toby Alt has really come up with an, another way of cracking that problem that doesn't rely on, on thousands of long simulation runs. And Toby and the rest of us who have been working on this problem 
have adapted this, this statistical tool called the linear inverse model, which essentially writes down some simple rules about how we think global sea surface temperatures and western United States drought operates. And the, the rules are pretty simple in the limb. We allow global SSTs plus atmospheric noise. Those are the two things that we do allow to influence drought. The model has a really narrow perspective, so it only knows about what's happened in the climate system between 1950 and 2000. We strip out all the trends, so we don't allow any low frequency variability to continue within our, our model. And I want to emphasize that there's absolutely no information about tree rings whatsoever. The, the model is just a statistical model that simulates SSTs, it simulates drought in the western United States, it doesn't know anything about tree rings. So in a way, this is, this is constructing a very crude and simple uh, statistical tool that we can use to generate lots of simulations over and over again to see how often we get mega droughts, just based on the way that the system is known to behave over the last few decades. And that's a real advantage. So if we run a thousand simulations and each one is a thousand years, suddenly we, we have a much greater sample to work with when we're trying to sort out whether, my, whether mega droughts are likely or unlikely. So really what we're trying to do is we're trying to use this statistical tool, we're trying to use the limb to construct a null hypothesis to set out what we think should happen if mega droughts that we see as reconstructed from tree rings, if they're just the product of a stochastic, linearly damped system with stationary statistics, just the last 50 years let run for a thousand years over and over again, do we see mega droughts? So we have two types of data. We've got the real data, the real estimates of past changes in drought over the last thousand years or so based on tree rings. And we're using the NADA as our gold standard to compare our statistical results against. So we, tr we take the tree ring data as reality. But then we generate a lot of fake data based on the limb. And this is, this is an example of one long-term simulation. This is all fake data. There's no tree rings involved. But if you let the limb run, for a thousand years, at least in this case, it produces five mega droughts, five events where we see prolonged drought over most of, or a big fraction of the western United States. But this is just a single run. So the question is, if, if we let this run for thousands of times, do we get the characteristics that we see in the real mega droughts as reconstructed by tree rings? Does this simple statistical emulator give us what we know that happened in reality? And the answer is yes, but sometimes no. So yes, we get mega droughts. More than one out of three simulations that we ran had a mega drought, at least one that was just as big, as widespread as the 11th century event. So spatial extent, you can produce one mega drought that's just as big as reality based on, on a random chance. And we also saw magnitude being successful. So more than one in three simulations had an event just as severe as the biggest 11th century mega drought. So if you just let the system run for a thousand years, one out of three times you see a magnitude, that's a mega drought that's just as bad as the one reconstructed by tree rings. So those two characteristics can be simulated by this stochastically driven model. The thing that can't be produced by the model is the clustering. Now, in reality, we see several mega droughts occurring in the western United States in the first half of you know, basically between 800 and 1300 AD. The model doesn't do that, or at least it doesn't do it more than, than one out of ten times. So that suggests if you want to get several mega droughts within a thousand year period, then you need something different. And this is, this is really echoing one of the conclusions that Sloan Coates and his collaborators came to using a different kind of approach in a paper in environmental research letters last year that suggested that mega droughts are, are improbable, but essentially they're not, they're not exceptional. And now we've got confirmation through the statistical test that even if the, the climate system behaved just as it has over the last 50 years, if you give it enough time, you should see a mega drought. So I think Ben, ben Cook, the, this is a quote from Ben Cook's paper in Why Is Climate Change last year when he pointed out that you know, it's maybe lucky that we just haven't had a mega drought in the last several hundred years. I think that's probably true. At least it's, it's, that's the same conclusion we'd come to from our statistical test. We've been lucky we haven't gotten a mega drought within the last few hundred years. But the chances are still pretty high. 
So one out of three of our runs produced a mega drought. So I think we have to acknowledge that even if the system just behaves as it has, if you give it enough time, you'll see a mega drought. And if you were let, if you were allowed the system to, to operate for a longer time, 2,000 years instead of 1,000 years, then that, that opens up twice the possibilities. And if you give it enough time, just you know, stochastic behavior, the structure in global SSTs are probably going to produce a mega drought in the western United States at some point. But the clustering, that's the thing that's really weird. It's not all just luck. So what we would conclude from our analysis is that that cluster of mega droughts that we see in the triering records between 800 and 1300, you can't get that just because of luck. You need something else, either increased radio forcing or, or land surface feedbacks or, or some kind of low frequency variability within the climate system that's not really that, that well rep represented by the climate data of the last 50 years. You need something different in order to reproduce more than one or several mega droughts within a relatively short time frame. So I think in that case, the model is helping us distinguish between things that, that are likely to occur just by chance and don't require a, an outside influence and things that are really, really different than what we've seen recently. So that's the implication that, that this analysis has for our interpretation or our understanding of what causes mega droughts. But I think more broadly, I think if I have a couple minutes to, to wrap up, more broadly, I think this approach might be helpful to other people, other problems in paleoclimatology when we're trying to understand the likelihood of connections between different parts of the system. I think, I think it's safe for me, the, I know the flood session is happening concurrently, and I'm, I'm part of the floods group, so I can, I can say something negative about the floods group right now. <laughs> I, I was at a Pages flood workshop last year, and I was struck by how difficult it was to make connections between paleo flood records in different areas and potential forcing mechanisms. And I think it's easy to fall into the trap where we, we compute correlations and we see things that are statistically significant, but in part that reflects the choices we make about what kind of comparisons we, we, we make and what timescales we, we make those comparisons over. So I think the limb might be helpful to, to kind of come at a first cut expectation, what we should see in different proxy systems. And in sen in sense, try to formalize a little bit of a, a null hypothesis or an expectation so we can, we can have an idea of what we think we should see between these different interconnections before we actually go out and, and start computing, computing comparisons. So I think more broadly, the limb could be adapted to other problems in paleoclimatology and do, to do so in a way that allows us to distinguish between behavior that is just going to come out if we watch it long enough. I mean, all of us are paleoclimate or paleoecological uh, researchers, and, and in some sense, time is the thing that, that, that we conduct our business with. But I think even for us, sometimes it's difficult to imagine how a system would operate over a thousand years, because that, that time scale is so detached from, from our, own, our own human experience. And I think the limb might be helpful to, to push us in the direction of deciding what's likely to happen by chance and what, what really requires the climate system to do something different that we haven't seen recently. And to, in order to make, make this tool a little, a little, little easier for other people to use, um, Toby has, has already gone ahead and uploaded all the code for the limb onto his GitHub site, and that, that's live today. So if anyone would be interested in looking at the code to check what we did, but also possibly adapt the tool to your own questions, uh, those resources are now available. So that's all I have to share today. So thank you very much, and, and thank you to Jason and Ed for inviting me. Thank you. A question if there is one? Uh, if you were to change the time period that you got your data from, your SST data and atmospheric data from, how does that change the occurrences of mega droughts? So if you were to use, say, the first half of the 20th century or you know, into the 21st, what your 50-year window is 1950 to 2000. What happens if you shift that around? I think the, 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 the biggest difference, we, the, the biggest decision we had to make about what climate data to include in was, was the detrending. The detrending <laughs> makes a difference. If we leave the, the late 20th century trend in, <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, I'll try and talk more quickly. <laughs> if, if we leave the trend in, then mega droughts become more likely because we've got this low frequency wave that's passing through our data. And we haven't tested it on the first half of the, the 20th century, but my guess is it would probably be the same. It's the, the trend seems to be the, the biggest thing that makes a difference. Okay, thank you. Actually, okay, Mike, is it gonna be quick? I think so. Um, one, que one question is, uh, did you include the, um, the spatial covariance in the limb? Because, of course, in the Western US, there might be spatial covariance in, say, soil moisture and prevalence to drought. Um, and the second question is related to Helen's. Um, to what extent is, should, should stationarity be part of or not be part of the null hypothesis? The stationarity. Um, yeah. <laughs> Yes, thank you for the question from my committee member. <laughs> my former committee member, yes. Um, uh, so the first question, Mike, was... <laughs> the spa no, the this, this, this spatial structure is cooked in. Yeah. So it's part... The, the spatial structure is cooked into the, the limb. So it knows that there's a certain spatial structure to SSTs. It reproduces reasonable spatial structure and in, in SSTs, but also... Um, the Western United, the, the, the PDSI, and it reproduces some of the spatial fingerprints that you see with real data. So that's one of the reasons why we think it, it might be producing realistic scenarios. And we'll I'll, leave the I'll second the question second for the poster question. session. Yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Hi, the title of my talk isn't entirely accurate because I'm also going to show you some um, rainfall reconstructions that is mainly Mandy Freund's work. So the rainfall reconstructions uh, for the entire Australian region. And uh, I'll still show you my, uh, uh, my streamflow reconstructions just for Tasmania. The other pictures on this slide are the tourism advertisements for Tasmania. All right, so the first question that uh, we need to answer when we look at these reconstructions, it'll become obvious why in a minute, is why don't we just reconstruct uh, hydroclimate for one season. The primary answer to that is that there are multiple drivers of Australian rainfall. So INSO's a big one. Uh, atmospheric blocking, uh, southern annular mode, and the Indian Ocean dipole are some of the biggest ones. And for each of those seasons, so each of these boxes here uh, is a di represents a different season, those drivers have different impacts across Australia. So these are only the dominant drivers for any particular region that are shown on this slide, and this is work done by James Risby. Then next to that, I've put Tasmania, because I'm gonna talk about Tasmania, and you can see that even between East and West Tasmania, in a single season, you can have different drivers. And coming from Tasmania, I know that the West Coast of Tasmania can be very wet at the same time that the East Coast is dry, or vice versa. So we have geographical and seasonal variability right across Australia. Um, so we sort of want to reconstruct for more than one season, particularly for those regions where we don't have the majority of rainfall falling in a single season. So the monsoonal north, you get the majority of the rainfall in the wet season, but that's not the case further south. You can have significant rainfall in all seasons. All right, so just uh, to look at how this works when you look at a map. So here I've listed the three major droughts, and this is work done by Mandy Freund. And that, uh, the patterns shown on the maps are the precipitation over those three major droughts that we've had in Australia sort of over the 20th century. So the millenni millennium drought is the one that Sophie was mainly referring to early on in her talk. And you can see that that's centred on southeastern Australia. The World War II drought, you've got a different spatial pattern. And again, the Federation drought, which is around 1900, um, again, has a different pattern. So the literature, if, if you're familiar with it, would bring up different forcing factors. So uh, one school of thought would say, for example, the millennium drought is more related to the southern annular mode. Some people would say the um, subtropical ridge is important. Um, World War II drought seems to have been a bit of a mixture and Federation drought, ENSO, seems to have played a major role in that. Okay, so if we just look across to some precipitation uh, 
instrumental precipitation data for different regions in Australia. So the different regions are highlighted in blue on each of those maps and the graphs correspond to those regions. So just go across to see the graphs that are related to each region. So if you look at the cool season precipitation first of all, which is April to October, um, you'll see that there's quite a bit of variability amongst those regions. So the same thing isn't happening all the time in each of those regions. Sometimes you can see some uh, similarity in the patterns. And also if you look across, so between the cool season and the warm season, you'll see that there's variability between those two seasons for any particular region as well. So you can have lower than average rainfall, for example, in the cool season, and increasing rainfall in the warm season. So that would be what the, what's happening in the top uh, region, so the central slopes, uh, in the most recent years. Okay, And you can see a repeat of that variability between the seasons across all those regions. So we want regional or sub-regional, if you like, and seasonal reconstructions because of this variability. So what I'm very briefly going to show you are two sets of reconstructions. The first ones have been done by Mandy Freund, um, and they're the rainfall reconstructions for those regions I just showed you. There are eight of those, and they're warm season and cool season reconstructions. And they're for what we call the natural resource management regions. So when Mandy did this, she screened predictors that went into these uh, models uh, for stability through time. So they had to have a significant correlation with the rainfall target for that region throughout the instrumental record. She used multiple proxy types and nested composite plus scaling. So for my dam inflow reconstructions, these are only for Western Tasmania. I've only used tree rings, and I've got a specific target in the middle of the West Coast. Um, I've screened them for significance, and I'm using a nested point-to-point -point regression, um, although in reality, you might as well say nested uh, PC regression, because I'm not doing a spatial reconstruction. So first of all, these are Mandy's reconstructions. So up on the top left, you've got a map just showing all the different proxy records. So there's corals, speleotherms, tree rings, and ice cores, so high resolution proxies. Um, and then the reconstructions for each of those regions. So on each of those plots, red is for the warm season, blue is the cool season. And where there's red shading, that indicates that there's a strong correlation of more than 0.5 between the cool season and the warm season precipitation as reconstructed for that particular region. The blue shading indicates that there's a strong negative correlation between the seasons. Okay, so the first thing you can take from that is that there's not a lot of periods where you have the same thing happening between the seasons or exactly the opposite between the seasons. Okay, so there's quite a bit of variability between those seasons. Okay, now the next thing that's a little harder to see because there are a lot of lines on this, but if you were to look at just the red lines going down for all those different regions, you'll see, for example, that there have been recent increases so for the warm season in a couple of those, particularly at the top. But when you go right down to SSWF, second from the bottom, there's no obvious increase. So again, you, you've got uh, that variability being reflected. And you can see that similarity or differences, if you like, going back further as well. And also note that the uh, cool season, you've got similar variability amongst the different regions. So the point is, you can't just take Australia and say, right, we're going to do a hydroclimate reconstruction for all of Australia and we're just going to do one and that'll be fine because there's a lot of variability across the continent. Uh, so looking more closely at the dam inflow reconstructions, the first question you want to ask is, well, Tasmania's this tiny island, so why bother? Um, just in answer to Sophie, I just have to say, we've gone one better, stuck the kangaroos, we've got Tassie devils, so that's why that picture's there. 
Um, as for why, well, we've got a lot of multi-centennial uh, tree ring reconstruct, uh, sorry, tree ring chronologies in Tasmania, more than any other part of Australia at this point. Um, as I showed you a few slides back, Tasmania is also affected by the same types of drivers as the mainland, albeit perhaps in different ways. And importantly, for Australians at least, Tasmania produces about 60% of Australia's renewable hydroelectricity. So that's really important for Australia going forward. And about a year ago, we had a major drought. Our dams were down to about 6% capacity, so we weren't producing much electricity for ourselves, let alone the mainland, and the government had to fly in diesel generators to keep the lights on at night. So we have major droughts in Tasmania, even though we're considered a wet part of Australia. Um, you can also see from a couple of those pictures the beautiful weather that we have on field trips. It's always sunny. Uh, plenty of dams and plenty of idiots with chainsaws to cut samples. No shortage in Tasmania. Right, so for my streamflow reconstructions, I've used a, largely used a machine called SilverScan, and this was developed by the CSIRO. Um, and the reason we're using this uh, is because ring width chronologies, sure, they have a climate signal, but the climate signal isn't particularly strong. Okay, it's there, but it's not really strong. And we've found that we get stronger signals in other properties. So things like density, uh, cell diameters, uh, cell wall thickness. And we're measuring these with this uh, machine at about 25 microns. So we're getting lots of measurements per ring. And that also means that we can start to look at the different seasons. So we can look at early season, late season with these different parameters. Another thing that we have measured for a few uh, sites is something called microfibril angle, which is the angle of fibres in the cell wall, which also has a very strong relationship with climate in the species that we're using. Okay. Oh, and that's measured at slightly lower resolution. All right, so to the reconstructions themselves, uh, I'm going to show you a winter one. So the sites are shown on the left. And the map that I'm showing you, Sophie referred to the Murray-Darling Basin, that's shaded in grey on that map of Australia. On the map of Tasmania, where there are three different shaded catchments, it's the catchment in the middle, the pink one, that I've reconstructed inflows for. The other two highlighted catchments there are very strongly related, or the inflows to those catchments are very strongly related to the Pink Lake Burberry catchment. And they're also all strongly related to precipitation on the west coast, as you would expect. The reason I'm reconstructing the pink catchment, or Lake Burberry, is because that has the longest and most reliable dam inflow data series. Okay, the, for the winter reconstruction, I've used ring width and uh, cell wall thickness. They were the only ones that passed the screening tests. For the summer reconstruction, I haven't used any ring widths. No ring widths passed the bar that was set. Um, it's all wood properties data okay. and different types of wood properties data. So these are the two reconstructions. So just a little bit of information on the calibration of verification R squared at the top there. Uh, the winter reconstruction is weaker than the summer one. That's probably not a great surprise to any of you who know Australia. It's much harder to find trees that are sensitive to winter than summer. Um, if you look at the winter reconstruction, I've just put a smoothed curve here because it's easier to look at. Uh, one of the first things that I noticed when I looked at it, after we plotted it up, was that there seems to be some kind of step change happening at about 1850. So you've got this decrease generally in the inflow. And all the lows, if you like, occur after that date. Uh, the highest single year inflow is actually 1816, which was fairly significant. Uh, if you want to know more about that, have a look at the paper in Water Resources Research that was published earlier this year. Okay, and if we move to the summer reconstruction, much longer, um, and you can see that there's a pluvial towards the start of that record that isn't repeated for the rest of the record. And then 
there's several large drought or dry periods around 1300, 1500 and the current period. Then I've just put them together down the bottom and you can see as for the rainfall, there's even with smooth data, there's not a lot of, a lot of synchrony between the seasons. All right, so just to finish up, I just wanted to show some other work that's been done by Ben Cork. Um, ben worked with the ANSDA data, so that's the Australian New Zealand uh, Drought Atlas, um, and he pulled out several different regions. One of those regions was southeastern Australia, and he looked at the PDSI and then did some forward modelling, so an ensemble of models. And he then looked at, well, what happens if we just look at the precipitation-based trends for the PDSI in those models? So that's the blue line. And you can see that for that region, there's not a lot happening for the PDSI. However, if you then incorporate the temperature trends, you get uh, more severe droughts, according to the PDSI. So if I then overlay my... Uh, inflow reconstruction for the summer period with temperature reconstruction for the same period, same region, then you can see that uh, negative correlation between them. And when you look at the 1300 and 1500 periods and compare them with the most recent period, I'd be a little scared if that were to continue. Okay, so just a couple of cautions on that comparison. All these different reconstructions are for different uh, areas, and the, my reconstructions only go to 2007. Okay, and I'll let you read those. Uh, I don't think we'll have any time for questions right now, unfortunately, uh, but uh, certainly at the uh, poster time, you can uh, talk to Kathy about this, uh, about this interesting uh, talk. Okay, well, good morning. I'm going to take us back to the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, no kangaroos, I'm afraid. Uh, and no numerical models, so if that puts you off, now is the time to leave. Okay, so yesterday, Tripti gave us an introduction to the climatology of this region. Um, I'm going to be focusing very much on the southern part, the tropical core region. So we have an area which today is dominated by summer precipitation but with this very strong gradient across the region. And in the summer, we have the influence of the ITCZ down in the southern part, and then the sort of mon monsoon proper, as it were, further north. Uh, winter rainfall, uh, rather sparse, really only a major element up in the extreme northwest, uh, being brought in by some frontal systems. And, but you do get some winter rain uh, in this area due to Nortes coming down and picking up moisture over the Gulf of Mexico. Although this winter rain is a small component of pro modern precipitation, in fact, in terms of explaining the hydroclimate of the region, I think it's remarkably important. The other two things you have to think about are um, this thing called the canicula, which is a break in the summer rainfall system, usually July and August. Uh, very important in terms of agriculture, particularly rain-fed agriculture, uh, largely affects the uh, southern and eastern parts of Mexico. And then, of course, we have hurricanes coming in, which can bring a very large amount of rainfall in a very short period of time. This is composite of 2015 and 16. So 2015, during the El Nino, almost nothing was going on over the Caribbean, lots going on over the Pacific. Uh, 2016 was beginning to get back a bit more towards normal. So across this region, there's been, uh, there is a preoccupation almost with rain. Uh, the rain gods, uh, Chac in the south in the Maya region, Tlaloc in the Aztec or Mexica region, central to their pantheon, and of course recurrent conversations about the role of drought in possible cultural collapse, uh, perhaps best known for the Maya, uh, the terminal classic drought, but really for a whole series of uh, changes. But links between drought and upheaval and disturbance, famine, um, this is a, a maize uh, yield reconstruction uh, done by Matt Terrell. Um, and you can see here periods of, of drought and high uh, falls in maize yield and uh, periods of disturbance. 
and even things like the Mexican Wars of Independence and the Revolution have all been tied into the occurrence of drought periods. So it's really important for this area that we can begin to reconstruct drought to understand the mechanisms, to think about whether those mechanisms are stationary or non-stationary through time, and to look at in more detail perhaps at the impacts of these droughts on particular, particularly on communities, different types of communities in different areas, and looking at responses and vulnerability and adaptation strategies. So I'm going to look at three archives here. Um, tree rings, uh, lake sediments, and uh, historical documents. Uh, Mexico has a rather sparse instrumental record of climate. Very few records go back before about 1920. Um, and I've taken this as a sort of SWOT analysis, so I'll come back to this later. So here are some of the strengths and weaknesses of these things. So the tree rings give us this lovely high resolution, seasonal records with good chronologies. Our historical records obviously are often date specific uh, and can tell you about weather events and impacts and strategies and recovery. Uh, lake sediments, which is what I normally work on, I have to confess, uh, don't come up to scratch in this regard. Uh, partly because of the chronology. You just don't get the accuracy on the chronology in most cases that you need to look in tight detail at these things. But there are issues around these in terms of what these different proxies are capturing and how representative they might be of wider change. So I'm going to look at these three uh, data sets. I'm going to take not the North American Drought Atlas, but the more recently published Mexican Drought Atlas, so this is a PDSI reconstruction for June, July, August. There is a problem with this because the rainy season in Mexico extends well into September and October, which will not be captured by this PDSI reconstruction. I'm going to use work on historical records from these three areas, Chihuahua in the north, Guanajuato in the center, and Oaxaca in the south. And I'm also going to refer to some work done by Blanca Mendoza using historical documents in the Yucatan. And then I'm also going to look at some wider reconstructions uh, based on uh, both lake sediment records and speleothem records uh, to try and give some extra information. So these, uh, I'm going to focus, uh, use the three historical data sets as my main focus, which as you can see lie across this gradient. The other reason this is important is that in the modern regime, we see very different responses in North and South to forcings like ENSO and the AMO. So in the North, an El Nino brings more winter rain and tends to dry out further south. The La Nina gives you the reverse, more rain down here and dry up here. And with the AMO, a positive AMO tends to bring more rain down here and dry up here. So this seasonal response and spatial variability are really important across this region. So on these slides, at the top, you're going to see the reconstructed PDSI, and at the bottom are some of the data from the historical documents. And the pink bars up here represent the major drought periods according to the tree ring records. So here we have major droughts in the 1560s, the 1660s, the 1750s over here, and then again uh, around about 1820 or so. And if you look at the... Uh, uh, historical records are so the blue dots, rather bizarrely, are the droughts. Sorry about that. Uh, pink is famine, and then we have epidemics in yellow and periods of unrest in green. So we do see some uh, early droughts in the uh, colonial records, but really things uh, begin to get very pronounced once you get to the 1740s, and in particular the period from 1748 to 1766, when there's widespread uh, loss of crops, death of livestock, outbreaks of violence, uh, and what's rather gloriously described as general pestilence between 1756 and 1759. And this does coincide with one of these major droughts in the treeing record. And then we see other significant droughts in the documentary record in this early part of the 19th century. So one of the questions is, is this increase in the records of droughts and catastrophe in the 18th century, is that a real increase or is it something to do with the nature of the records? And there was certainly a lot of economic development in Chihuahua over this period, a growing population, 
and an expansion of agriculture and mining, which put more pressure on the system. If we move down to central Mexico, to Guanajuato, here are the uh, long periods of drought in the tree ring record in the 1620s, the uh, late latter part of the 17th century, and then again towards the end of the 19th century. These are not the same periods of uh, long drought in Chihuahua. This is the drought reconstruction based on documents. Uh, we have here uh, evidence for a number of droughts in the 17th century. Uh, six of them seem to have had a big impact on harvest. Uh, but again, it's this period from around about 1750 when you see uh, prolonged periods of drought, crop loss, uh, harvest failure, and so on. And within this, you do see the year of great hunger, 1785-86, uh, where you had starvation and unrest. But again, the question is, is this a real change in the frequency of drought, or is it about the records? In Guanajuato and in the Central Highlands, we do have a few lake sediment records uh, which show some of these drought periods. This is from a crater lake in the Valle de Santiago um, where they've reconstructed drought based on the calcium titanium behavior. These orange bars are their reconstructed droughts from the lake sediment records. I've put them up here against the tree ring records and we see quite a nice correspondence in this, in this location. And the suggestion here is that these dry periods represent El Ninos, uh, and this is a sort of southern behavior within the context of this system. I put this in as a bit of a cautionary tale, and Scott's already touched on this in terms of floods. So these are flood records from Guanajuato. 1692 was a big flood, 1770 was a big flood, and those have been associated with extreme precipitation in those years. But most of the floods in this record are actually attributed in the documents either to the vagaries of geography in relation to valleys or to mismanagement of hydrological systems, people putting barriers and walls and, and things where they shouldn't have been. So there isn't a connection really here between floods and wet climate. And if we go to our southern site, so this is down in Oaxaca, uh, this is the wettest of the sites, around 1,500 millimetres of rain, Lots of occupation of the valley bottoms here for growing crops and, cattle and raising cattle. Here are the tree ring droughts. You can see there's one here in the 1580s, one here in the 1760s, and then another in the 1820s. Down here we have uh, evidence from the documents of drought and harvest failure in the 1730s. But what's really notable is down here in the south is you do not see this series of big drought events in the, from the 1750s onwards. You don't see the year of great hunger being expressed down here in terms of drought, but you do see some extreme weather events being reported in 1783 and 84, which may or may, may not be associated with the lackey fissure eruption. Down here, there just seem to be more relationship between uh, floods and perhaps climate. So this flood event in 1603 is also recorded up in Mexico City. Um, we have explicit reference to hurricanes occurring in 1783 and 1788, and possibly two other previously unrecorded hurricane events in 1599 and 1721. So perhaps rather different in the south from some of the other areas. So if we take the worst drought years in our, uh, instrument, in our historical documents and look at the PDSI reconstructions, you can see that for Chihuahua in the north and Guanajuato in the central part, the tree ring reconstructions show drought generally as well, so that's okay. But if you look down in the south, you can see there's blue as well as this or orangey color, so it's not, the tree rings are not capturing what's going on according to the historical documents. And in some cases, uh, things just go completely wrong. So 1812 to 14 in the PDSI reconstruction is unusually wet. But actually, if you look at the documents from Chihuahua, you see drought, crisis, delayed rains, grain shortages, complete catastrophe, really. And up here is a separate tree ring reconstruction just for the winter and spring precipitation. So here's the 1812, 1814, which indeed is wet here, but actually the previous years, winter dry conditions can be really important in terms of determining drought up here. <coughs> 
So if you're looking at impacts, uh, you really have to look at the antecedent conditions. What about this expression through space? So 1750 to 55 is one of the major droughts in the PDSI reconstruction. Here's the drought reconstruction from the documents. Yes, you see it in the north and the center, but again, you don't see it in the south. You're seeing this antiphase behavior across the wider region. And at different scales and using different types of proxies, you see this recurring. So if you do a broader reconstruction over the period of the medieval climate anomaly, you get dry in the north and wetter down here, but the central highlands this time are going with the north. But if you look at the Little Ice Age, the central highlands are behaving more like the Yucatan and in opposite behavior to the southwest USA. So we've got combinations of La Nina or El Nino type behavior and AMO perhaps activity down here, but certainly the central area is switching its mode. So sometimes it's going with one area and sometimes it's going with the other. And this is a, a compilation that Dave put together some time ago, but it's showing the frequency of antiphase behavior in the PDSI between the Southwest USA and Mesoamerica. So that's more often the norm, but just occasionally they all go together. And those are the occasions when you can sometimes get drought across the whole region. So we need to use our range of archives to extract this seasonality, this change potentially in stationarity, but also to look at the impacts of these things because when it rains or when there's a drought really matters in terms of people's ability to survive. Um, and some of these proxies are really under stress, so there's a lot of felling of old growth trees going on, lakes are being dried out because of groundwater abstraction and the sediments are going and being deflated away, and many of the uh, regional archives are in pretty bad shape, and I put this picture up because we were working near here on a lake, this town of Mascota had a nice archive, uh, unfortunately it burnt to the ground. So if we're going to help to understand both droughts in the past and think about how we might learn for that for the future, we need to use these different archives and integrate them better to understand the hydroclimate and its impact. Thank you, Sarah. I think in the interest of time, we should continue our world tour uh, and jump across the pond to Europe. Thank you. I will today present a work in progress, a quite recently started project about summer drought and summer temperature co-variability in Europe. And this project was kicked off in December last year in Stockholm when I had the pleasure to uh, host a Euromed 2K workshop. The last Euromed 2K workshop where we will continue with the project after uh, phase two have ended in pages to investigate this issue with drought and how uh, drought and temperature have co-varied in Europe over various timescales in the last millennium, including in the 20th century. And why do we want to study the co-variability between temperature in the summer and drought in the summer in Europe? I would say that it's, we have at least four reasons to do so. One is that in, for some regions, as we all know, global warming presents a major threat for increasing droughts, or in other regions, increasing floods, and so forth. And drought is the most serious threat to agriculture in Europe and in most other regions. However, climate models do not show a consistent pattern of change. Some regions, say seven models out of 10, show increasing drought, but three show increasing rainfall. Uh, so in very many regions, we show, see no consistent pattern. And the wet uh, get wetter and the dry get drier paradigm have been rejected for as much as almost 90% of the land area from instrumental data. Uh, so the reality seems to be much more complicated. And we also have increasing evidence from around the world that the relationship between temperature and hydroclimate might change with timescales, and it's highly timescale dependent, and I will come back to that in a little minute. 
And what do we see in the instrumental data from Europe? Summer temperature versus summer PDSI. Well, we see basically that everywhere that we have some significant covariability, warmer summers gets, gets drier. But this is on interannual timescales, and it's only some regions where we have a strong relationship. But several new studies from last year have shown that this relationship between summer temperature or temperature in general and hydroclimate change with timescale. In a study that I led, was published a year ago, we also see that the models don't really agree with the proxy data in most regions over very long timescales. At centennial timescales, you see in the proxy data much stronger hydroclimate anomalies than you see in the simulations. And also a study by Raphael and Laple from last year showed that the linkage between summer temperature and summer drought in monsoon Asia differs with time scale, and that the agreement between model data and, and simulation data, it's the same on interannual time scale, but it's even the opposite sign on centennial time scales. And also another study by Hoa et al. from last year shows that every warm period in China have has its own patterns of hydroclimate anomalies, no real consistency. And now we have new possibilities to obtain a millennium scale perspective on the covariability between summer temperature and summer drought in Europe, thanks to a, a gridded product from Lutebacher et al. 2016 of summer, of summer temperature in Europe, mainly derived from tree ring data, also some historical documentary data, and also the old world drought atlas by uh, Cook et al. And for the purpose of this study, we have updated both products, so they are totally independent with no overlap in tree ring chronologies. And, we, and the drought atlas is also extended towards the present. However, I must acknowledge that in some regions, especially in Western Europe and easternmost Europe, both products have a slightly less skill than in Central Europe. So, to be honest, we can make the firmest comparison in Central Europe from Central Scandinavia down to Northern Italy. And in this project, we will also look at instrumental data. So we look at the crew instrumental data over the 20th century, both for PDSI and for summer temperature, June, July, August. And then we use the updated uh, summer temperature atlas and the updated old world route atlas. And we also will use two model simulations, or two, clim uh, two simulations with two climate models. And we use the CCSM4 model and the MPI model. And the reason for this is that they are the only really high resolved mo models that really can capture high climate on a regional to local scale in Europe. And we will basically use five different uh, methods or tests to look at the covariability between summer temperature and summer drought in Europe over various time scales, from high frequency to low frequency, from interannual variability to centennial variability. And we will first look at cross correlations between gridded temperature and gridded proxy values and, and the model fields. And then we will look also at the sign of agreement between the sources of information, just to see if they agree even in the sign and then the distributions of correlations. And we will also perform cross-spectral analysis and finally conduct cluster analysis to see if we can detect modes and patterns of covariability. And I can now show some preliminary results, and they are very, very preliminary. If you look at of the whole period from 850 to 2003, in the high past filtered data uh, for PDSI and UNULI temperature from treating data, we basically see very weak correlations from minus uh, 0.2 to plus 0.2, basically, and only one little point here, one grid cell that have any significant correlations. Otherwise, nothing is significant. <laughs> 
But if we go on to the medium low pass filter data, so to say, we only preserve frequencies from 20 to 100 years. We do show, see some interesting correlation patterns. We see a positive correlation patterns. Warmer temperatures, wetter in Northern Europe, and drier in most of Central and Southern Europe, especially Eastern Mediterranean. And if we go on to look at the real low pass filter data, we see a total another pattern where most of Europe when it's warmer, it gets wetter in the summer, except parts in the far south. However, it's only significant here in northern central Europe. And if you continue to look at sub-periods, we go to the medieval climate anomaly and look at the filter data that only preserves 20 to 100 year, year variations. We see still this positive in northern Europe and more negative in parts of southern Europe, but it's not really any clear pattern. And if we go on to Little Ice Age, we see that the patterns change. And we have still this positive pattern in northern Europe and a negative pattern in most of southern and central Europe. And if we continue and only look at the 20th century, now we have the problems with very few degrees of freedom, but we see this very strong negative correlations between temperature and drought in southern Europe and still this positive in northern Europe. Let's now go on and briefly look at the model data. Here we again, even on the 20 to 100 year filter data, see in almost all of Europe this negative correlation between temperature and drought. And please observe that this is also true in Northern Europe, in Scandinavia. And it doesn't really, is model dependent. Both models shows very similar patterns in this regard. So and now again, compared to the tree ring derived products, here's the model data, and here is the tree ring derived product. And here we see the positive that pops up in the model, not in the model data, but in, when we correlate the grid temperature and grid PDSI data from tree rings. And also, if we go for the real low frequency, we see different patterns in the Little Ice Age and the Medieval Climate Anomaly, but I wouldn't make much of this because of the very few degrees of freedom. But to conclude, and now please remember that this is still very preliminary. But I think we dare to say that the covariability pattern between summer temperature and summer drought do indeed change, and the correlations become stronger at lower frequencies in the tree ring derived reconstructions. And also that the spatial patterns and the strength of these spatial patterns also varies with, with time scales and between the warmer and, clim and colder climate states. So we have a different correlation pattern in the 20th century in the med medieval climate anomaly and during the Little Ice Age. And we do find some support that the droughts in the Mediterranean region is unprecedented in the 20th century compared to earlier centuries in the last 1,200 years. And we can see it even in the treeing data, and here we have agreement actually with the model simulations. And finally, I want to highlight that the spatial patterns of covariability are both weaker and less clear in both model simulations. And the model simulations also show less difference between various periods than the triggering data. And this is only very preliminary and we have only gone into the cross correlations. And we will look at the distributions of correlations and also modes of variability with cluster analysis is the next step. And we hope to also try to identified modes of temperature and drought covariability, modes of droughts, and maybe in the end try to compare it and infer it from circulation modes, for example, for the North Atlantic. And now I hope we have some seconds at least for questions. <laughs> Thanks, Frederick. You. Frederick helped us make up some time, so there's uh, time for at least one question. Mike, down here. <laughs>
Wondering if, um, if there's a significant cross correlation between PDSI and temperature in the uh, direct observations, and if so, are you controlling for that in your cross correlations in the reconstructions? Yes, they are, but they are not strong at interannual time scales in most, re in most regions in Europe. So, but uh, it's hard to make a uh, comparison with instrumental data because we only have the basically the 20th century. And if we go down to the Kale time scales, we have very few degrees of freedom. But we do f see a similar pattern over the 20th century in uh, instrumental PDSI and reconstructed PDSI, yes. Although there's slightly different, uh, slightly difference in the patterns. And I started to test that and think it's very much depending on the exact seasonal target in the instrumental data. If you include also the spring season, you will get a much more similar pattern between um, uh, the proxy data, the training data, and the, the instrumental observations, if you include April and May, and not only June, July, August. OK, thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, I work as a postdoc at the Université Catholique de Louvain <laughs> in Belgium. Um, mostly with UGOS. And here, I'm going to present a few results uh, of a study which is about the reconstructions of the East African rainfall and of the Indian Ocean sea surface temperatures uh, based on the data assimilation method. Uh, and first, the motivations of this study. Much, or at least a big part, of the East African uh, region is characterized by a bimodal cycle of uh, precipitation. So here, you can see the mean annual cycle of uh, precipitation over the last century average over the, the black region. And you can see that indeed you have a first and main rainy season from March to May, which is called the long rains, and a second uh, rainy season more modest, which is called the short rains from October to November, sometimes December's, uh, December. And although it's more modest, this second uh, rainy season is actually responsible for much of the interannual variability of the East African rainfall. So it's quite variable from uh, one year to another. So here you can see uh, those short rains um, over the past 35 years. And yeah, you can see just by eyes the, um, that the variance of this time series is quite uh, large. And actually the peaks and the lows of, uh, of the short rains often coincide with the extreme uh, weather events that uh, have affected the region quite dramatically these past few years, more, uh, both droughts and floods. And this curve is uh, quite strongly correlated with the sea surface temperatures over the Indian and the Pacific Oceans. So here, this is the correlation uh, coefficients between the short range average over the white uh, frame and the SSTs um, over the period 1950 to 2005. And you can see that, yeah, the correlations are quite high. And there is this uh, interesting dipole. Uh, if you look at the Indian Ocean, with positive correlations uh, in the Western Indian Ocean, negative ones in the in eastern part of the basin. So in this context, uh, the objective of our study um, was to answer the question, can we use this well, long known and well known covariance between the East African rainfall and the Indian Ocean sea surface temperatures to obtain a better reconstruction of those two variables? Like if you have um, a good idea of what is going on in the uh, Indian Ocean, can we use this information to obtain, uh, to improve the representation of this East African rainfall? We have uh, done that through a, a data assimilation method. So in paleo uh, climatology, data assimilation is a tool uh, which aims to combine the, the, the empirical information from the proxy-based reconstructions with the, with the results from climate model simulations. Um, you all know here that those two source if, uh, sources of information are pretty different. Uh, Proxy-based reconstruction will often be local. Um, a proxy is influenced by several variables, so we'll, you will have to think about what is actually reconstructed in terms of climate uh, variable in the, from a proxy. There are time uncertainties in the age model, and the proxy-based reconstructions are often qualitative. But of course, the big advantage of, of those proxy-based reconstructions uh, is that they are from the real world, while the model will always be a simplification of the reality. So those two sources of information are very different, but they are quite um, complementary. 
and there are potentially huge benefits uh, to use then uh, in combination, which is the aim of data assimilation. Uh, sometime, sometimes help uh, by uh, foreign modeling to, to have a quantitative comparison between the simulated in the, and the observed or the reconstructed variable. There are uh, several different methods uh, of data assimilation. Here we have used an offline method based on a particle filter. Um, and I'm going to explain this here without showing any equation. Um, offline method means that we have used an existing ensemble of, simulation, uh, of simulations, which is here the last millen millennium ensemble of CSM1. So it's uh, an ensemble which contains 10 simulations over the, the last millennium period. And let, let's say that here you have those two, uh, 10 simulations uh, in a grid cell that contains a data you want to assimilate, <coughs> here shown in blue. Well, after one step of assimilation, in our case it's one year, uh, we compare each uh, of the ensemble members to the data. And based on this comparison, we compute the likelihood, which is uh, just a measure of how close each simulation is from the data, taking into account the data uncertainties. And based on this likelihood, uh, weight is attributed to each of the ensemble members, or weights between zero and 10. Um, and these weights allows computing the weighted mean, which is our reconstruction for, uh, for a given time step of assimilation. And so we hope uh, that the way it mean our reconstruction gets closer to the data, which is technically the case uh, when the data is uh, included within the range of the ensemble members. Okay, so to make uh, data assimilation experiments, we need data, and in this case, we have used the Delta O18 content of coral uh, archives. Uh, the choice of the data is based on the, on the synthesis uh, done by Jessica Turney. Um, this variable is strongly related to the sea surface temperature, and uh, the data cover periods from a century to, uh, to a couple of centuries. And here you can see uh, the six grid cells, oceanic grid cells of CSM1 that contain a data site, so it's quite relatively well spread over the Indian Ocean. And before uh, assimilating the real data, we wanted to first check whether our method works uh, technically or not. So we wanted to test it in a simplified framework, and the most simple framework you can imagine here is to assimilate instead of these real data, pseudo data coming from the model uh, CSM1, so the model that uh, provides the ensemble members. So in this case, the, the physics is supposed to be perfect, since in the same in the data you assimilate and the uh, ensemble members. Um, so here, what is shown, uh, the diagnostic that is shown is the coefficient of efficiency, which measures the, the reconstruction skill, when it's red, it means that you have uh, the reconstruction has some skill, so it's better than a climatological mean, and when it's blue, uh, it means the opposite. And we assimilate here, so the data only uh, in the point where real data exists, okay, the six oceanic point, well, crosses here. And you can see on the right that uh, assimilating the six uh, SST pseudo data points um, uh, provides a pretty good spatial reconstruction of the SST uh, all over the Indian Ocean. So the, the information contained in the six points we assimilate is well spatially spread uh, over the Indian Ocean, but it's also propagated, propagated to other variables, uh, such as the rainfall, because we can obtain uh, with this experiment uh, pretty good reconstruction of the rainfall all over the Indian Ocean, but also on the East African region. But this is a very simplified framework, but in this case, it works well. So now let's have a look uh, at the real data when we assimilate the real data. And first, we're gonna have a look at the local scale to uh, check whether there is uh, or not inconsistency between the data we are assimilating and uh, the ensemble member. So here, here it's an example uh, for the Marindi sites. Um, you can see the model ensemble mean and range of the delta O18 for the, for the, the grid cell containing the marine site. And this is the, the measurements of delta O18 that uh, we want to assimilate. Well, you can first observe that the model mean does not show any long-term trend over the past century, while the data clearly shows a, a decrease in delta O18, which means that there is an increased uh, sea surface temperature there. And in green, here you can see our reconstruction for that, that precise uh, grid cells. And you can see that it, match, uh, it matches pretty well uh, the data we want to assimilate. So it just means that our method works well at the local scale. But of course, it's a minimum requirement. What we want here 
is this information to be spread over the, the Indian Ocean to have skillful reconstructions at the, uh, the places where no data exists. And we want this information also to be propagated to other variables such as the East African rainfall. Um, and this is the results when uh, we assimilate the real SST related data. So you can see on the right that uh, we can still obtain only by assimilating the six, uh, the six uh, SST related data points over the Indian Ocean, we can still obtain a pretty good uh, skillful reconstruction of SSTs all over um, the Indian Ocean. And yes, this um, reconstruction skill was here computed uh, by comparing our results uh, with observational data sets over the past century, because of course there are, not, uh, there are no proxy-based reconstructions that cover especially all the area that could allow uh, computing this diagnostic. Um, so this, uh, we obtain a skillful reconstruction of the sea surface temperatures, uh, but the way the East African rainfall are constrained by this improved sea surface temperature uh, is actually not consistent with the observation. So we, we can't get any skillful uh, reconstruction of the East African rainfall. Um, and this is, hi. <laughs> And this is actually due to, um, to the fact that the simulated um, teleconnection between those two variables uh, is different than the observed one, even if uh, CSM uh, does a pretty good job in, in uh, this diagnostic. So, but well, yeah, we still, good, uh, we still obtain a good reconstruction of the SSTs to, to end up on a positive um, idea. So for the conclusions, there is a, a well-known statistical link between the East African rainfall and the Indian Ocean sea surface temperatures. And this link can theoretically be used to obtain a better reconstructions of those two variables. And I didn't show uh, you all the results here, but we can really, in an ideal framework, obtain a better Indian Ocean SSTs only based on the assimilation of the East African rainfall, and the opposite is true as well. Um, but when we start assimilating real data, uh, well, the, the skills of the reconstruction uh, gets limited, uh, mostly because of uh, the model physics, uh, of biases of the model physics. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, we have time for questions. Uh, anybody? Mike? There, yeah. Oh, uh, uh, Christoph first. He's right there. Maybe it's just a comment. Uh, I was just puzzled that you call it assimilation because, you know, when I think of assimilation, I think in numerical weather prediction, and this is a fully different approach compared to what you are doing. So you are, well, I would call it more clo closer to an analog method or so, or say an offline. Well, it's an offline particle filter, so it's, it's, it's not really assimilating the data in a model simulation, right? Well, I think that... Uh, so it it's a selection process which you're doing, right? Yeah, a selection process. Uh, yeah, we, we choose the best uh, estimates and we wait. Uh, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. It's like a weighted mean of the best estimates. Right. But I think it's still a data assimilation method, uh, I think. I mean, this method is based on a, on a paper from Dubinkina in 2011, and she called she called it data assimilation method. So. Sure, but yeah. <laughs> I'm just but saying agree, that, that, yeah, it's, it's that you talk to other people, then they, they would just think of yeah. fully okay. different different things, right? Okay. So, um, when you, when you started, you showed that there was a strong correspondence between East African rainfall and and so patterns. So I was wondering, did you try the assimilation project? Um, using the data from Tierney et al. that were from the Western Pacific and the Central Pacific, because maybe that would add some skill, even though paradoxically it's farther away from your target region. I haven't tried it, uh, but that would be indeed a very interesting uh, stuff. Here it was more like a, uh, more a theoretical study, uh, the first one, but definitely that's the kind of thing that we would like to do uh, to reconstruct the, yeah, the Indian Ocean Dipole and. Uh, the link with Enzo and so on, it could be really, uh, I think, a good idea to do that. But we haven't tried that yet. It's possible that I, I just missed this part of it, but um, this, the, the CESM Last Millennium Ensemble doesn't have oxygen isotope uh, in it, so are you interposing a, a forward model that connects the oxygen isotopes of the corals to 
some some of the model field that you do have and, and how are you doing that? Yeah, yeah, the, um, the model Coral Delta 18 is actually computed from a bivariate uh, function based on the simulated SSTs and SSS. I think it's an equation from Thomson uh, 2011. Okay, thank you. I think it's time to move on. So I just want to take a moment to thank my collaborators on this project who are all listed here on the slide. So we're taking a continuous look at mega droughts and how the characteristics of these mega droughts, and by that I mean decadal and longer time scales of drought, change as we go from the past into the future. Before we start though, I, I think there are a couple important considerations to highlight. So first off, when looking at the past in this context, we're gonna need to be using the paleoclimate record because the observational interval is just too short to be able to resolve these time scales of variability. When we're looking at the future, we're gonna be use cli using climate models, uh, but we'd like to know that these climate models are gonna tell us something useful about the future, and that's not an easy determination to make, but one way that we can approach that to sort of first order is to compare the paleoclimate record to the climate models over a common period. And if climate models aren't able to simulate mega droughts realistically, well then why would we ask those climate models how the features of these are gonna change uh, as we move into the future? So this type of approach isn't new. What I'm showing here is the spatial grid corresponding to the North American Drought Atlas, which we call the NADA for short. It's a tree ring based reconstruction of PDSI which is a metric of near surface soil moisture. I wanna note that I'm gonna be using PDSI throughout this talk. And I wanna caution that when I'm talking about results, specifically as we move into the future, uh, the results that I'm gonna show are really relevant to near surface soil moisture, but might be less relevant to things like vegetation change or changes in runoff. So this data set, the NADA, uh, is, uh, spans the whole of the last millennium. It's from Ed Cook and colleagues. And it's been used extensively to study drought on these timescales and for comparison to the paleoclimate record. In particular, it's been used over this region here that we call the Southwest. You can see the box here on the grid. And typically these studies have involved averaging reconstructed PDSI over this box to look at the temporal characteristics of drought in the associated time series. And I think the results have been really useful, but they're limited in one particular way and that drought is a spatiotemporal phenomenon, but these studies have only been rigorously looking at the temporal characteristics of drought. So with that as motivation, we're gonna expand upon these analyses, but instead we're gonna identify and characterize droughts in three dimensions, with those dimensions being latitude, longitude, and time. And to provide a brief example of what we're gonna do here, I'm gonna take this drought from 1773 to 1782, which is a 10-year period where reconstructed PDSI over the Southwest was persistently below the mean. What's shown here is a three-dimensional grid. So we've got latitude here, longitude, and time. Uh, the arrows here are showing you the latitudinal and longitudinal extent of this Southwest box and the temporal extent of this drought. So ideally what we'd like to do here is to assign to each of these space-time grid points whether they're in a drought or a normal state. And in this sort of arbitrary binary context, you can imagine assigning space-time grid points in a drought state a value of one, and in a normal state a value of zero. And that sounds pretty straightforward, but there's something that we know about drought, and that's that drought has some spatiotemporal persistence, and we'd like to take that into account. So ideally, we'd like these ones and zeros to be sort of organized in space-time. So in the context of identifying a drought, we're identifying a contiguous and distinct sort of cloud of ones that's gonna be snaking here through space-time. And it just so happens that uh, identifying features like this is a problem that's well posed by finding the most likely configuration of a binary Markov random field. I don't have time to go into the methodology here, but as it turns out, you can't explicitly solve this problem. It's too computationally expensive but with the help of machine learning, we can construct an algorithm, and the output of that algorithm is gonna be the droughts that we identify, and this algorithm can run on a laptop in the span of about 10 minutes. So this would be the output over this three-dimensional grid of that uh, drought identification algorithm. So I'm showing just the space-time grid points here that were in a drought state, and we can see this sort of cloud of droughts. And I'm gonna define four metrics that I'm using throughout the talk to characterize these three-dimensional drought features. The first and most important is going to be a metric of severity. So what I've done here is I've split things out into sort of a two-dimensional view here of these space-time grid points, and I've now colored the grid points based on their PDSI value. So downwards here, the darker oranges are drier conditions, 
I'm going to define severity as the sum of grid point PDSI over that full cloud of drought. In this case, the severity was about negative 870. So this isn't exactly a metric of severity. It's sort of a mixed metric of both severity and size. So I'm also going to define a metric of size so we can sort of split these two things out. Size in this context is just going to be the total number of space-time grid points that are a part of each of these drought features. We can further split size out into the length or temporal extent of these droughts and the width or spatial extent, so in latitude, longitude space of these droughts. So we're going to be looking at these four metrics here. And I've only shown you one drought over the nada, but we're actually going to do quite a bit more of that. We're actually going to identify all droughts over the last millennium, not just in the nada, but also in the Old World Drought Atlas, or AUDA, and in the Monsoon Asia Drought Atlas, or MADA. So we're going to be identifying droughts over all three regions over the full of the last millennia. Over the same grid and time period, we're going to look at six forced transient simulations of the last millennium. So they should be feeling approximately the same external forcings as the real world over this period. So hopefully it's a decent uh, comparison here. Four of these are going to be from CESM, one from CCSM, and one from IPSL. And then we want sort of as much information as possible as we move into the future, so we're going to look at a broader suite of models, 32 CMIT-5 simulations uh, going through 2100. But these don't go all the way back uh, through the full of the last millennium. I just want to note that for the rest of the talk, I'm going to be referring to the regions by their drought atlas name. So if I say OW or Old World, I'm referring to, for instance, this European region. And then what are we going to analyze? So we're going to analyze the characteristics of mega droughts in the past, as I note. So over all three regions, we're going to use the paleoclimate record over the last millennium. I want to argue that we're not just interested in sort of the general characteristics of mega droughts, but we're also interested in their centennial scale natural variability, so that as we turn to look at the future, we can look to see if those changes in the future are sort of significant beyond that natural variability. In order to capture this, we're going to be looking at 100-year intervals across this 1,000-year time period. For each 100-year intervals, we're going to take all the droughts that we identified, and we're just going to look at the top 10 most severe of these droughts. We're going to rank them based on that severity criteria, and for our purposes, we're going to call these our mega droughts. So we're going to do the same thing for the model simulations over that contemporaneous time period. We're going to hope that the characteristics of the mega droughts that we identify in these models is sort of broadly consistent with what we're seeing in the paleoclimate record. And if we see that, then we're going to turn towards the future and ask these same models how the characteristics of these mega droughts are going to change. So there's going to be quite a bit of information in this plot, so I'm actually going to walk you through it using the severity of mega droughts in the paleoclimate record over North America as an example. So what I'm showing here is uh, the time axis. And as I noted, for each 100-year period, we're going to be identifying the top 10 most severe droughts. So I'm denoting the severity of these droughts here by these x's, and that severity ranges anywhere from about negative 300 to nearly negative 1700. In order not to do just complete information overload, we're just going to look at the average characteristics of mega droughts for each 100-year period. So what we're going to do is take the mean of these 10 severity values, and we're going to plot that. So we're going to plot negative 700, which is the average severity uh, for this 100-year period. So we can do that for all 100-year periods, and we can get a time series that shows us both the sort of general characteristics as well as the centennial scale variability here. Uh, the range here is between about negative 550 and nearly negative 1350. So there's a huge amount of centennial scale natural variability, at least in terms of the severity of mega droughts over North America in that paleoclimate record. Just to denote this visually, I'm going to put two dashed lines here. The reason that I'm going to put these there is that we start to put the, the model simulations on here. What we're going to hope is that the model simulations fall quite nicely between those two dashed lines. That would suggest that the general characteristics of mega droughts within the models are consistent here with the paleoclimate record. We'd also like them to sort of traverse this full space, as would suggest that they have realistic centennial scale natural variability. We have to allow for the possibility, however, that there be 100-year periods within the models where the mega droughts are either less severe, which would fall to the left of the dashed line, or more severe, which would fall to the right of the dashed line, than any that we see here within the paleoclimate record. So I'm just going to denote this visually. If I'm falling all the way to the left side of this gray shaded region, then for that 100-year period within the model, the mega droughts are 50% as severe as any within the paleoclimate record. If I fall all the way to the edge of this darker gray shaded region, then for that 100-year period, those mega droughts are 200% as severe as any within the paleoclimate record. So I'm going to start adding the models on here. Now I've got IPSL in purple and CCSM in green. 
What I'd argue we're seeing here is the broad consistency that I was looking for. We don't want to be too hard on the models, but these are generally falling between those two dashed lines. There are some really interesting intermodel differences, however. So if we look at IPSL in purple, it's lying all the way here over this left dashed line, which suggests that megadroughts within that model are less severe over North America than the paleoclimate record. CCSM looks a lot better. It does get a little bit too big, but it's pretty consistent with the paleoclimate record. And also in CCSM, we get quite a bit of centennial scale natural variability. So we're really traversing this full space, whereas in IPSL, we fall almost entirely along that dashed line, which suggests that there's no centennial scale natural variability in terms of mega droughts within that model. We can also look at the mean of those four CESM simulations in blue here, as well as the range, which is this blue shaded region. What we see is a picture that's quite consistent between CCSM and CESM. This isn't all that surprising. These are two models from the same model lineage. So we're getting the broad consistency that we were hoping for, and I think that suggests that we can start to look towards the future. So what I've added here is the mean and range of these 32 CMIP5 models. I'm just going to, again, denote visually, this dashed line is going to be the end of the historical interval, that 100-year period from 1901 to 2000. And all the way up at the top of this plot is going to be the 100-year period from 2001 to 2100. And so what we see as we look into the future over in North America is mega droughts are becoming much more severe than any time over the last millennium. So this is nearly 350% as severe uh, as any mega drought period uh, within that paleoclimate record. So we can do the same thing over the monsoon Asia and old world domains. And what we see is a very consistent picture here. We get the broad consistency that we were looking for of the last millennium that continues all the way up to the end of that historical interval. But as we move into the future, these mega droughts are becoming much more severe as they have been uh, over the last millennium. So we can actually split this out and try to understand why mega droughts are becoming more severe. So one possibility is that these mega drought features are just getting much larger. So we're looking at this size metric now, and what we see is that there are large increases in size in all three of these domains. But the magnitude of those changes are just not enough to be able to explain these huge changes in severity. And so what that suggests is that two mega droughts of the same size in the past and in the future, that mega drought in the future will tend to be more severe. We can further split size out by the length or temporal extent and the width or spatial extent of these droughts what we see is something really interesting. So although the size is increasing, that's really predominantly driven by increases in the length of these droughts. However, when we look at the width of the droughts, there's really no changes. So the spatial extent of these mega drought features as we move into the futures does not appear to be changing. The other interesting thing is that although we had really broad consistency here for both the size and severity of the mega droughts over the last millennium over all three domains, when we split things out by length and width, we do appear to see some fundamental biases. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to this old world region, where we get mega droughts that are about the right size here, but that appear to be way too short. So we're falling all the way against this left dashed line, and much too wide, all the way against this right dashed line, as compared to the paleoclimate record. And I think that suggests two things. So first out, that's a discrepancy that we'd like to try to figure out, but I think it also sort of undermines our confidence in future projections, at least over that region uh, coming from these climate models. They don't appear to simulate mega droughts in a realistic way. So just some quick conclusions. We implemented a method for identifying droughts in three dimensions. We then characterized mega droughts over the last millennium. And finally, we analyzed the characteristics of mega droughts as we moved into the future. We found that models and reconstructions are consistent, and that's all the way up to the end of the historical interval. However, that there are some persistent model biases that may undermine our confidence in future projections of drought. And in particular, I highlighted some issues with the characteristics of droughts over that European domain. The last thing is not everything changes about these droughts as we move into the future. In particular, although the size, severity, and length of these droughts appears to be increasing, the actual spatial extent does not. And this method is really nice. It's not fixed in space, so I'm not just talking about droughts over the southwest or the northwest or the central plains. I'm giving sort of a general statement on droughts. And one of the things that we can do with that is ask if, well, is where these droughts occurring in space changing as we move into the future? And I don't have time to show that, but it turns out that that's not changing either. So the sort of distribution of where these occur uh, appears to be staying about the same in the future as well. All right, that's it. Thanks. All right, th thank you, Sloan. We have time for a question. Over here, Sophie. Over here. <clears throat> thank you. I have a, a non-hydro question. Um, would that 
approach also be appropriate for applying to other short-term events that have important spatial structures like heat waves? Yes, yeah, so it's actually scale independent. It can identify droughts from one grid point up to thousands of grid points, and it doesn't care if it's hydroclimate. So you could do heat waves on short time scales, you could do you know, three-dimensional structures in the ocean, it should work for everything. Um, and I'm gonna be putting it together as a package that I'll release when I release this paper. So hopefully people can throw it at all sorts of fun projects. I have the pleasure to make the wrap up before the lunch break. And uh, today I would like to talk about cyclone. So I would say the reason at least for the mid latitudes where, where we have precipitation and also wind extremes. And um, I ask three questions. I would try to address three, three questions in this preliminary results I, I have so far. So first of all, if you, if you start doing analysis with models, which we have to do because cyclones of the past millennium, we don't have proxies on half daily or six hourly data, which we need to really characterize cyclones. Um, so we rely on models and it's clear if you rely on models, you would first have to show that the model is reliable for nowadays climate at least, right? So this is, this is the first part of the talk. And then, then we, we go over to how do different cyclone characteristics change in a seamless simulation uh, which we use for that study? And then clearly the last question uh, which I briefly would like to, to look at, and we are working currently on that to, to get more insights in it, is how does the external forcing influence these cyclone characteristics? Now, what have we used? So we, we, we use the CESM model, uh, coupled to a carbon cycle, and we use the high resolution, so in all components we have roughly one degree resolution, um, and uh, we run the model uh, starting from a 500-year control run for A50, um, uh, we branched that, and then we had a transient simulation seamless from 850 to 2100 using the RCP 8.5 to see, well, what's happening also in the future. And the beauty of this simulation is that we have 12 hourly data uh, in most of the meteorological uh, relevant data um, uh, which, you, which you really need. And uh, I would say 12 hourly data is the edge of uh, doing cyclone statistics. Now, um, to give you a flavor of uh, the forcings of the simulation, it's almost PMIP3 type simulation with one exception, uh, exception which is shown here. So we increased a bit the amplitude of the solar forcing in our simulation by a factor of two, uh, roughly, uh, from the classical PMIP setting, right? So you see here the different uh, solar uh, reconstructions, the very strong amplitude reconstructions, the Shapiro forcing, which was uh, thought to be uh, more unrealistic, at least was treated or assessed in the last IPCC to be the more unrealistic compared to the others. Now, the other uh, ingredients are as, as usual. So we have volcanic forcing, falling gao, and uh, we have also uh, greenhouse gas forcing, and um, important for the, for, the, for the carbon cycle, we have also some, uh, some uh, changes of the land fraction, so on the vegetation types and things like that. Now, uh, to start with the evaluation of the model, what you see here on the uh, left-hand side is uh, cyclone frequency for the period 1980 to 2000, uh, 2010, roughly 2009. And what we do is we, we really track each cyclone in the winter season and, well, we identify the cyclone and then we track it in time, right? And what is shown here is, in a way, the tracks occurring at the grid points with a frequency, so when, when we see here something like 20%, so that means 20% of the time we find there in a the winter a cyclone, okay? And uh, now you can compare that to the same period in our simulation, and it's clear we, uh, overall, we get the main storm track area from uh, covered about here uh, uh, around Iceland, reaching to, to Scandinavia, we have a second storm track here in Mediterranean, and both features are nicely represented in our model simulation. It's clear we have a bit of more cyclones here 
it's, uh, the reason is that we, we, we use here a coarser resolved version of error interim, so you would expect a bit less cyclones in, uh, in error interim compared to CSM. Now, um, I would like to mention we have two shortcomings. One is we, we underestimate cyclones before the Iberian Insula, Peninsula, and we underestimate also cyclones here in the Mediterranean Sea, although we have a better res or higher resolution compared to the one which I used here for aero interim. Now, to get a more handle, we now concentrate for the rest of the talk in this area, so we get rid of a bit of these uh, strange things up here happening. So we have here some, some orographic, unrealistic features in, uh, in our model simulation, uh, leading to a detection of a permanent cyclone up there, which is not realistic. And uh, cutting out this, this, this area here in black, we will do a lot of statistics in the mean, meantime now. And this is shown here now. What you see here is uh, different uh, distributions of different cyclone characteristics. So we start here with the lifetime of a cyclone, and you see, well, uh, both distributions more or less coincide, but you already see, well, we have a tendency that the model is a bit underestimating the lifetime. So we're producing two short cyclones uh, compared to reanalysis data. Um, if we go to a measure of uh, the wind, which is here shown by a gradient around the cyclone, uh, which is related to the geostrophic uh, wind, uh, it's, it's, it's a wind measure, we see due to the uh, reduced resolution in era interim, um, we have uh, less strong cyclones and we can have uh, very strong cyclones in our uh, simulation. Um, Central pressure is doing the same, so we have here clearly uh, a tendency of, of having stronger cyclones uh, compared to era interim. But you see a double peak structure, which also shows already that there may be some biases in the model with some overestimation of cyclones, which are quite weak, uh, which we normally don't want to have, and that can be some heat lows over the Saharan uh, or over Northern Africa, which, which is not interesting. Uh, interesting in terms of, uh, say, mid-latitude cyclones. Now, uh, another measure is the radius of the cyclone, so the area of the cyclone. And uh, again, we have a good agreement between the two uh, measures. And the final, and I think the most important for this session, uh, index which we use, we, if we have the radius around a cyclone, we can estimate the cyclone-specific precipitation. So we take the radius, take the area and average over the precipitation in this area, which gives us the cyclone-specific precipitation. And again, we see that uh, our model tends to be a bit too dry compared to reanalysis data. Now, as I'm interested in extremes, I have to define extremes. And I just put that here uh, sketchy in, in our uh, distribution. So we are looking at the 90th percentile of these distributions in the next step, in the time series of that. Uh, and we do that for uh, a lot of these characteristics here. And uh, before I do that, I uh, just would like to show you that uh, we can, uh, well, if we do such an index here, for example, for this gradient measure, so for the uh, wind speed around a cyclone, uh, for the extreme wind speed, we can do a correlation pattern with, for example, uh, geopotential height in 1,000 hectopascal. And what you normally find then in winter is, well, we see this NAO type uh, pattern, a bit shifted to the east, uh, if you wish, and uh, which, is, which is the correlation between this percentile measure over these 30 years. And uh, we see that the model is, is able to catch also the correlation structure, although we see already also there are some deviation. Okay. But in principle, I would say the model is able to get the main features right uh, if it concerns um, cyclones, at least for the, for the uh, say, observed period. Now, coming now to the indices. And First thing is, well, number of time steps of cyclones over that area in the North Atlantic average, right? And uh, what is shown here is now the interannual variability in black, 
and uh, the 30-year running mean in, in red. And uh, you see, we have quite a lot of variability, interannual variability over the last millennium. And um, whereas, well, we have the same variability maybe for the radius, uh, but when we look now into the more, and I'm zooming now, I'm just zooming out the 30-year the running mean. If we look now in the decadal scale variability, we see, well, we have strong decadal scale variability throughout the, uh, thanks, uh, throughout the, the, the uh, say, the pre-industrial period, and then we see here a sudden trend to less cyclones in the future. So, less cyclone time steps in the future, right? And, well, the radius shows not, not a clear behavior uh, over, over, over the period, but still we have strong variations which are, which are very interesting to analyze them. So we have internal variability which plays quite a, a, a strong role on cyclones. If we go now to the to, um, uh, pressure, uh, say, uh, or wind related uh, measures, and I uh, flip directly to the, to the um, uh, low frequency uh, behavior we see for sea level pressure, central pressure, which is another measure often used in cyclone statistics, we see not a clear trend in the last century, uh, although we see a lot of changes here in, uh, within the millennium. And well, for the gradient measure, we have a tendency to uh, leave the range given by uh, the pre-industrial period uh, until the end of the century. But it's not it is not strongly out of this range, right? So, but that means at least we have periods, we can join a period where we have storms with less wind speeds. So we have a reduction in, in uh, severity concerning wind speeds. Now, um, the last one is the precipitation, uh, which is shown here, precipitation related to cyclones. And I move that up again, and you see here again we have a lot of variability going on, and then from the 19th century up to the 21st century, we have a strong increase, leaving the range of, of uh, precipitation uh, given by the, 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 the pre-industrial period. And this is clearly, this has something to do that uh, we have a moistening of the atmosphere. And we have to, to deal that if this is really following the Clausius-Clapeyron relationship. Um, now, the question is, what is the, the, the forcing imprint? Do we have a forcing imprint on these two, on these two extreme uh, value measures we have here? And uh, the first one is the solar forcing. So I just highlight here uh, the, say, uh, states where, where it is positive, and then the classical Mont de Minimum, Dalton Minimum, and so on, minima periods in, in, the, in this period. And when we compare that, which is shown here, we see not a clear signal for neither of these periods. There may be something for the precipitation index, but it's not very clear, and we have even some periods where we don't have a clear, say, uh, a forcing imprint where we have a very strong reaction on the, on, the, on the precipitation, if you think like that, or this period. For the gradient measure, it's even worse, so we don't see any common signal if we compare that to the forcing directly. Now, if we go to the future, I already discussed this one here. So there we see some signal happening at least in the precipitation uh, severity index of cyclones. For volcanic areas, I did also a hand wavy thing and I will have to redo that. Um, so I highlighted the volcanic periods, only the strong ones. And again, for both indices, you sometimes have the feeling to see something by eye, but if you really look closely, you don't see a clear imprint in both of these severity indices concerning volcanic forcing. So what we see over the last millennium prior to 1850 is mainly internal variability. Now coming to the questions. So yes, we are able to, to uh, realistically simulate storms but we have some biases. So think of the Mediterranean cyclones. Um, and we have some, some underestimation in the length 
and uh, related precipitation is also underestimated in, in, uh, in our simulation. Now, um, we find pronounced inter interannual to the decadal scale variability, which seems to be, at least at a first glance, um, uh, not dependent on the external forces. And it's clear uh, this simulation also provides a nice field for looking at the extremes, uh, say, in a thousand-year event for the North Atlantic or for Europe. We, we can split that also to uh, Europe. And that brings me to the end. So what's coming next? Correlation analysis. We would like to do a super epoch analysis to really rule out or to see whether we have volcanic forcing imprint or not. And then it goes to the mechanisms uh, behind these uh, say a variability we are seeing over the last uh, 2,000 years. With that, I stop here. Uh, th th thank you very much, Christoph. Uh, it is lunchtime now, and I think a lot of hungry people are probably wanting to go, so we've run out of time. But I, I, we, we gr greatly appreciate uh, everyone who's come here for our session on drought variability and so on. And especially, of course, we thank the speakers for uh, spending their time and effort to uh, give us wonderful presentations.